so I had a little bit of a chance. I don't know if you just got my questions like half an hour ago. I was like, I did. <laughs> <laughs> but your questions are amazing. So we could probably just like kind of, you know, riff off of those. Right? Oh, I sat down to rain. I didn't know where to start. It's, yeah, there's um, so much there. Because I feel like there's so much I want to ask. But at the same time, I don't know very much about you except for the right. stuff I've been able to check out. But um, yeah, exactly. I'm obviously very interested about in the programming that you do. But that seems like I'm sure there's lots of info about that anyways. Yeah, no, for let's sure. See. We'll yeah, chat let's just see and see where this goes, right? Yeah, I mean, this is a, the opportunity for you to let people know about your event that's coming up. So maybe we could start with that. And you could let let us know kind of what you're doing and when it is and that kind of stuff. Yeah, okay, sure. That's right off the bat. Let's do yeah, it. Let's, um, yeah, let's just get that out of the way so people know that that's happening because that sounds like an awesome event that yeah, tell us I, you want to go to. <laughs> I am super, super excited about this, actually. Um, it kind of all pieced together very spontaneously. So um, that's, cool. that's the best way. Yeah, <laughs> it was very <laughs> unexpected. So um, I jumped into like another teacher training for yoga yeah. recently because uh, so I trained as a as a yoga teacher in Houston in 2016. Oh, in um, Texas? Is that no, that's a lie in 2018 in Texas. in Texas. So in Houston, Texas, I trained uh, in 2018. And then I trained again in 2020 when the pandemic happened. And there's like, I can get into the story about all of those later. Yeah, for sure. But just yeah. to kind of <laughs> to, to kind of bring everything, everyone up to speed for what's yeah. happening right now, for what's, what's happening next Monday. Um, my yoga studio where I trained, they just came out with this fantastic online course, like online version of their 200 hour teacher training that comes with, um, that comes with one-on-one uh, -on -one, like support with my mentor. And I was just, in a place right now where I'm starting my own business and I'm yeah. kind of, uh, it just felt like the right time to get more of that support for me. So right. uh, going through it like the third time now, uh, <laughs> it's not really, it's not really to learn so much about how do I teach yoga and what's the yeah. anatomy. I love that stuff. It's a lot of fun, yeah. but just to be able to bounce ideas off of somebody who has built an incredibly successful business and is basically doing what I want to be doing. Oh, that's so uh, exciting. To me, that was so invaluable. And um, so this guy actually, Andrew Dugas, he founded the Yoga Better Style and uh, he is a former bass player. Okay. And that is. Oh, well, that's so great. Yeah. I love when there's that yoga yeah. string connection. Yeah. yeah. So that's for sure why I was drawn to him as a teacher to start with. I didn't even have very much of a yoga background, but um, just just knowing that this is a fellow musician that like really gets musicians, and yeah. um, he's completely obsessed with anatomy and just has such a um, kind of no nonsense like this is right. how your body works approach. Right. And um, that to me, I value so much because I like when things are kind of just very straightforward. Yes. There's no mystery. Yes. Like right. these are the muscles that move this joint. Yes. Like, and to me, <laughs> I, I initially was so drawn to this because I was like, wait, I mean, I teach people how to move their bodies all the time. I just do it for playing cello. Right. And how much value would it add to my teaching if I could actually have the sort of training where I knew how they're physically doing what they're doing. Right. And so that's kind of where I started in 2018. And then fast forward now, uh, we were on a call a while back and I was like, hey, you know, I'm teaching these classes. I started a class for string players. And yeah. I think yeah, in, I saw in, that. in February, I think. Yeah, and was that last, last year? Yeah, I started dabbling with it. Oh, yeah, it was last year, actually. I yeah. was started dabbling in it in the fall and then slowly kind of got it got it going. And it was like, how do I get the word out? How do I get like more kind of more people? And I love doing yeah. this so much. I would love to do this like every day if I could really. <laughs> but like, you know, you have it to It takes actually, time to build, right? And we're yeah. in the process of building those like, oh, my goodness. <laughs> It takes time. And it's you know this very well. Yeah, what no, you for do, sure. For sure. <laughs> so. You got to get that word out there. And that takes a lot of talking to people and networking. Yeah. yeah. And just you never know who among who among your contacts is actually going to be like super interested all of a sudden. Right. And uh, so we had this one of our calls recently when I was talking about, hey, I think I should do some sort of a workshop. And yeah. I'm just trying to figure out how I should offer it online or. Right. So we, we started talking about these things and it, I realized, Hey, I'm going to Houston in yeah. a, like a few later that month. So this was about probably a few weeks ago, a month ago, we were talking about this. I was like, I'm going to Houston so that my 
Houston students who I'm still teaching online can have a recital. Um, oh, wow. I have, yeah, I have a You're few really rooms. between the two worlds right now. <laughs> oh, a little <laughs> bit. So I have booked a hall and everything. And it's like, okay. Oh, my gosh. And here we are talking about this workshop. And he's yeah. telling me how like great it would be to do something like a hybrid. And I was like, wait, I'm coming to Houston. He's like, hey, do you need a space? I was like, of course. Oh, <laughs> so it all just like lined up and came together. Oh, and so um, for me, it's really exciting because I started teaching yoga during the pandemic. Right. So most of right. what I taught is online. Yes. Um, and I taught I taught lots of privates in person and I taught um, a couple of like small group classes in person that were just sort of right. one offs. But um, I teach from my house. I teach from right here. This yeah, is the space. Same <laughs> exactly. Yeah, this is my world. <laughs> so yeah, to come back and to be able to teach at the studio where I trained. Uh, oh, and that's so to, nice. Like, so it's like a full uh, circle. Yeah, and to yeah. invite like the musicians that I was working with in Houston. Yes. And so, of course, we're making it a hybrid event. So, okay, yeah, so I was going to ask. So that means it's going to be like yeah. in person, but also... It's going to be online. in person, it's going to be online, it's going okay. to be recorded. Yeah. And um, I, the Yoga Better Studio, actually, they were way ahead of the game before the pandemic started. They had already started building um, a very robust uh, website with on-demand content. Yeah. And like, no, having no idea, of course, that this was going to be their mode of survival for <laughs> like Isn't a couple of years. Yeah, I mean, like, businesses had already started a little bit of a head start. They were starting to do that. Yeah. Stuff. Like, oh. And they had all of the like tech and all of the like all of the video equipment. So right, right, right. I'm really excited to be able to actually produce this workshop with like so good cool. video and good audio. And yeah. I'm going to make the recording available to everybody who registers. Wonderful. So yeah, even if you yeah. can't come live, you right. can always I'm it. definitely going to yeah. sign up because sometimes, sometimes I find it hard to go to a live event because I'm so busy with all my own stuff. But I, I, I have like a sort of list of things I've signed up for that I still need to watch right on the recording. <laughs> It's good to have oh, too. for the future. It's like, when I'm ready, I'm going to watch this. <laughs> Isn't that also like, I don't know, that's kind of, it's the downside as well as the upside of being able to access all the stuff that's recorded. Yeah. I think it's I find true. myself getting a little greedy sometimes. Like yeah. I want to see all of these things. <laughs> I think it's a little bit, like, I have a friend who really loves books and when she goes to a book sale, she'll buy like, you know, 30 books, but she's not going to read all those books. She just has this big stack. And I kind of think of it like that, just being surrounded by this, like this, this great educational material that I'm going to get to at some point. It's kind of nice, but yes, it's like, oh, I want it now. <laughs> I'll, I'll get it. Oh, but I, I've also found so much value though sometimes in, in, signing up for something and almost forgetting about it but then later remembering it's like wait but i had a i know i had a resource for this and then i can't come back yeah. and i dig this up and i watch it and it's like wow this is gold yes exactly. and just being able to come back to things and watch them over and over again yeah exactly that um the indian style cellist i think you went to his workshop did you there's one go? more i went is to the there? first one i okay. think i think the last one is tonight Oh, right. So, yeah, so I, ju I just have the recordings, so they're waiting for me, but I'm so excited. I really want to learn how to play cello, like, sitting on the floor. I don't know if you've tried that out yet. I but haven't. I'm really, I'm really intrigued, because I tried it on my own, and I'm like, this this is way too big. So I was wondering if his cello is, like, a three-quarter or something like that. I, just, it looks pretty normal. It does, um, right? So yeah. how do you get around? Because when I sat down on the floor and tried to play, that did not work out. So I'm sure there's like a very special way that you need to kind of set it up. I'd like to play around with that and see. Yeah. Um, I have a few um, kind of qualms about the kind of the positioning for yes, for the it spine. Does, yeah. It seems to me like it might not be optimal. It does look um, like it'd be a very reclining you know, that's why I thought with the yeah. big cello when I sat down, I felt like I had to do this, like, you know, recline I, backwards and then I was okay. trying to get around it. So I was thinking with a smaller cello, like with a half size or something yeah. like that, I think it could that would really, be, that really would probably well. be easier. He yeah. has, um, like, um, a scarf of some kind that's, I that, saw that, that that's hold, kind of that like attached it. to it. Yeah, yeah, so I don't know. I think it maybe goes around his waist, but it, right. I think it goes around one of yes. the, like, one of the corners of the cello somehow. It yes. looks pretty snug, but I'm not sure about how ergonomically it. Yeah. sound it is. <laughs> yeah, but it's nice because what it what I like about the setup actually is that it yeah. puts the cello at a very horizontal angle, which right. I've always really strived for. But my I have really short legs, well, proportionally <laughs> to like yeah. I mean, 
uh, not actually proportional to me, but in yes. proportion to the in, cello. I'm in I'm, general. I'm five four. Yeah. Same so, here, actually. We're probably right. pretty similar. I don't know about our proportions, but height wise and right. height wise. <laughs> but I mean, the cello is yeah. just like the knees have to be in a certain position. Thank and you. for me to put it as flat as I want, I either have to put my knees behind the cello or like come up with something very, it just doesn't work very well. But yeah. I, I played for years with a very flat top. And yes. Uh, I had like, to sit like all vertical. Uh, like, like well, I had a I had a tortilla end pin like the bent. Oh, okay. Pin. Oh yeah. Okay. The, that and I would have to sit back and wear the tallest heels that I owned, so that like. <laughs> That's what my teacher. <laughs> so that my shoes she, would be taller. She recommended. Yeah, Shauna Rolston. I studied with her. I don't know if you've seen her perform, but she always performs with like the four inch heel at least. Yeah, that was me. <laughs> that was me. I had to practice in these shoes yeah. because I couldn't get the same posture. Right. Um, now I kind of use like what I call sort of a ballet style. Like I'm on the balls of my feet a lot. Mm -hmm. And I've really uh, brought my end pin down a lot more than I used to because I used to have it kind of very, um, I guess, high on the chest. But then I found, you know, it was me putting me in that reclining position, which didn't feel good for my back at all. So I've really come forward a lot. And mm -hmm. now I'm on the balls of my feet a lot more, kind of like a dancer, which I feels good same. for me. Yeah, I'm I'm the same and it's the struggle of I <laughs> feel good in my body, but I want I want that angle. I right. I'm having the fingerboard a little bit like just yeah. a little bit flatter here yes. and a little bit higher up and being able to reach. Right. And for tone, right? When you've got that yeah. uh, greater angle, like then your bow kind of sinks in a little bit yeah. better. Of course. Yeah. Like there's always, yeah, there's always that struggle with the balance, I think. Yeah. Probably for people our size. Yeah. <laughs> That's why I always suggest the smaller cello, because I've always played on a full size and I'm used to it. But for people who start, I think if they start at an older age and they're a bit smaller, I think that just slightly smaller cello helps them to, you know, yeah, they tell me they're able to navigate it a bit better, right? And you can get such fantastic seven eights now. Yeah. I mean, you could always get fantastic seven eights, but I think yeah. it's it's becoming a little bit more kind of people is in demand now. People are asking. Yeah. Right. Like, yeah. No longer. Maybe yeah. No longer so frowned upon to like play a smaller <laughs> instrument. Yeah. yeah like, yeah. why not? <laughs> so back to your event then. When is like tell us when is the date and how can people access the event? Like if they want to sign up for it, where where would you go to do that? Sounds good. Uh so the event is next Monday, the 23rd. It's at noon central time. So that's Houston time. That's 1 p.m. Eastern. Awesome. And I've scheduled 90 minutes. So I hope I hope we fit in. It's never enough time, right? No, oh, no. <laughs> There's always a lot <laughs> more. Never to see. quite enough time. Yeah. And uh, to sign up, so I'll share the links with you because they're not yes, all easily memorable. Do. Yeah. But my Instagram has. Um, in my profile, it has all of the links to everything. You can sign up in person or online. True. And my Instagram is uh, at yoga dot with dot Sonia. Okay, great. And yeah, like Sonia, after this, uh, yeah. sorry, we just, I'll, no, no, <laughs> Sonia with Sonia with a Y. But again, it's easier to just put it all in writing. Yes, yeah, and I was just gonna say after this recording, I can actually I'll do a little bit of pre production or post production. I can put that right on the screen so people can see. Sweet. Where to go. Awesome. <laughs> so look on the screen right now, you'll see. I, I can write it on my notepad and hold it up. <laughs> exactly. No, I can just do some text across the screen. Yeah. <laughs> That's it's awesome. great. I don't know. Were you always this like technology savvy or is this uh, like this? No, God, no. It's it's like survival here. So yeah, I mean, so you're seeing people that, so just before the pandemic, I mean, I had, like, I done a little bit of work um, with microphones and I did a little bit of home recording, right? But I never considered myself tech savvy. I just was playing around with those things. So it was sort of about six months before the pandemic, I had bought myself a Blue Yeti microphone. I'm kind of thinking that I might start doing um, just like home recording or podcasts or something, but then it sat in the box and was doing nothing. It just sat there. I wasn't looking at it because I'm a little bit technophobe, like, or I was at that time. I was kind of scared of technology. didn't want to deal with it. But then the pandemic hit. I was like, oh my gosh, I have to teach online. And I was looking at the microphone. I'm like, well, it's now or never <laughs> to plug that in and figure out how to do this. So since then, I really have, I mean, you probably found this too, like just the learning curve for learning about technology and being online, there's a lot to learn. Uh, but now, like, I feel like I'm at a place where um, I'm a lot less scared, you know, like something new comes my way. I'm like, yeah, I think I'll, I'll figure that out. So it's been a big um, kind of opportunity in a way to learn about technology and 
and uh, figure all that stuff out. So I'm happy for that opportunity. I guess it's like a silver lining of the terrible thing that happened. <laughs> yeah, no, for sure. I, I think, um, I mean, we're both in the online space. I think we've both kind of been able to branch out quite a bit because of the pandemic. So there's yeah. definitely a silver lining to all yeah, of Yeah, I mean, that's been so neat, actually. It's just the opportunity to connect with cellists and different people all around the world. And with mm -hmm. people spending more and more time online, that's been a really neat opportunity as well just to see what people are doing and to, you know, yeah, connect with cellists who might kind of jive with my philosophy of teaching. And so just to have that bigger audience is really great. How many, how many students are you, how many cellists are you teaching right now? Do you have a, a studio? I had a number. <laughs> you have your shoe I students. I had a number, but I forgot my yeah. name. I, I sometimes go back and count my students. Yeah. <laughs> I, 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 actually, I, have, I have a system. I have a, I have a software that I use. Yeah. In, the, in track, but I actually yeah. don't always remember what the number is. Well, I don't know if we need specific. No, it's something, <laughs> I, it's something between 15 and 20 something that I'm working like that. with right now. So, yeah. Uh, and yeah, I have uh, quite a few adult students that I work with. Um, most. Most of them are online. Yeah. Most of them are in Houston, but not all. Nice. And then I do some other online programming for adults that um, it's not necessarily for my students. Uh, so it's right. kind of everything but private lessons because right. there are only so many private lessons that we can teach in a week. Oh my gosh, I know. Right, and I'm sure you know yes. this. <laughs> and energetically, it can be quite, it takes a lot of energy. Right? It does. So I really try to limit. Yeah. You know, it's hard when someone asks for lessons because, you know, I've been in Ottawa a long time. So now people really ask me, like, my studio is always full. And I always say, okay, I'm not going to teach any more than 20. And then someone will ask, and someone will ask. They end up like up at 25. And then I'm like, oh my gosh, it's so burnt out. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I was thinking about this actually before because um, I just moved to Ottawa. Well, to Gatineau, actually, but to the Ottawa yeah. area. And just because of the recent move and also of course in light of the pandemic uh my schedule went from being about half and half teaching and playing to mostly teaching and right. then also like with the yoga venture and then kind of yeah. working on my online businesses and yeah i uh, like that's a completely different animal all of a sudden so those hours i don't know those i don't even count them no <laughs> i don't either it's kind of whatever right? all the time <laughs> all the time <laughs> all the time <laughs> anyone that thinks it's easy by the way oh my gosh <laughs> i know like i'm still gonna throw a program together nope <laughs> but uh i i just was thinking about how different it is to spend like six hours of a day teaching versus yeah. six hours of a day sitting in rehearsal. Right. Um, like they're draining in different ways, but uh, when yeah. I when I give my energy so like openly in a way that yeah. I do when I when I'm constantly interacting with human beings, right? And like especially if it's teaching music, yeah. Um, teaching yoga somehow is a little bit more down to earth. I think maybe there's Ooh. less. There's less explaining. There's more doing. Right. And um, maybe perhaps not so much hype. Like I find, yeah. you know, are you, I don't know if you find this, but with when you're teaching, you're also kind of a coach, right? Yeah. So you have to provide motivational speeches, <laughs> you know, keeping people going, getting them through the hard times, that kind of stuff. And I love it. Like, and I'm yeah, I think I you do that. too. It's like, I love oh, it so exactly. much, but yeah. I go, go, go. I talk, talk. And then I stop talking. Yeah. It's like, and it's just like, I just need the silence. <laughs> yeah, and, yeah, silence. Yeah. I like you go home after a rehearsal and it's like, okay, you know, maybe, maybe you need a little break, but I never feel so yes. like drained yes. emotionally. And, and like, it's a good oh, kind of drain, yeah. draining, like from, yeah. from the teaching. It's super rewarding. It's just yeah. when I would, when I'm thinking about like, uh, I don't know what what is a normal job these days anyway, right? right? But like when you, when you when you go on go in and do yeah. your thing for you know yeah eight hours a day and then you when go it's home. when yeah. you go home yeah but it's this like when all when your work is so based on just a human interaction all of the time I'm sure people yes. in customer service can relate yes it's like when yeah you're constantly and in a service them. where you really truly care about yeah. your clients you know and you want the best for them and i think teachers in general find this it's hard you need to like put boundaries between like you know what you need for yourself to keep your energy kind of intact versus like that feeling i think as teachers we very naturally give our energy right so it's easy to just keep giving it 
and giving it and then like realize that you have none left <laughs> for yourself. Yeah. So what? I found I've had to, and I'm sure yoga probably helps with that, you know, keeping like your, just being able to replenish your energy. Yeah. I actually wanted to ask you about that. What, how do you manage that? Because I think we're in the same boat. I think you do a Very lot of teaching. Similar. Yes. I do a lot oh. of teaching. And um, so like, I, I manage it through, um, I would say, wellness practices like yoga. Um, my yoga practice tends to steer more towards um, like the meditative. So I like to meditate a lot. Like I'll just sit and be still and, you know, get my candle out and my little Buddha and I just sit there for a while and just breathe, just like lots of breathing. So I found like for me, that's the most replenishing thing and then often like after i've done that for a certain amount of time it sort of naturally will go into sort of what i call like an improvised yoga flow so i do a lot of like yoga um that's very much improvised like i just allow my body to move in a way that i want it to move and where i feel it needs help right where i need to kind of stretch out and i do it in the in that way so i usually start with kind of a meditate meditation and sitting and then try to listen to myself and feel what it is that I need, you know, what my body needs. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's wonderful. Yeah. So I'm, that's all kind of for, <laughs> I'm all for improvised sequences. Yes, I and, do a lot of that. And then that's, you know, as a cellist, I do that too. I'm an, a big improviser. So I think it's just part of my nature to kind of take things that like I've had some formal training you know I, I, I've taken lots of yoga classes I'm not I'm not a yoga instructor like I've never taken teacher training though that's something I'm really interested in doing at some point um but all of the classes that I've done and all of the meditation that I've done I've kind of just like pieced it together into my own style that I find very replenishing so that is one way for sure um another way is connecting with nature right so as soon as I start to feel really stressed like I try to make time to go outside because I find going outside just you know even just within like five ten minutes I feel different sometimes I can be really stressed out and then I just go for a walk and then oh okay I'm not so stressed out after all so that's something that really helps me also yeah how about you what do you find helps to replenish your energy well I'll probably have some similar answers actually yeah. <laughs> the same with you. Uh, I try I try and have a daily yoga practice in the mornings um, yeah it's I'm not always successful I'll be honest that's okay um, yeah but creating I, that routine of discipline yeah. is the hardest thing I, I about anything I, yeah. <laughs> I try and build up my routine like starting with small things and I usually start my day with a bit of meditation so nice. I just do like sit in silence and uh, maybe set some intentions, maybe just allow myself to calm down, right? not jump straight into the to-do list. Yes. And I find really, really helpful. Um, and it's helped me to kind of really enjoy mornings as well. And now that it's actually getting so nice out, I can go oh, outside for these few mo moments. And yeah. so I'll sometimes like sit on the porch with, uh, with a yeah. few cats. <laughs> which inevitably <laughs> follow me outside <laughs> in <the> rest <laughs> while I get clawed at feed me. Um, and yeah, then I'll, I'll do either a little improvised yoga practice or sometimes I'll have a little bit more structure and I'll follow a video um, yeah. like from my instructor. Yeah. And, but it's, it's like really important for me that whatever I'm doing then, it's like really for me, I'm working on my own stuff. It has nothing to do with like a class that I would teach. Right. Um, and just listening to my body and sometimes really experimenting with things as well. Like if there's something that I'm curious about, maybe bringing into a class that I'm, that I will be teaching later, then yeah. I might play around with it if it's really coming from, okay, what do I need right now? Right. Um, I've been like really into just all sorts of like health optimization for years and like, uh, probably anyone that knows me closely is going to say that I'm like obsessed with nutrition <laughs> and things like that. So all of that kind of feeds into just, um, just like keeping, keeping myself healthy so that I can do the things that I like really yes. love doing and have the energy to show up, um, like for my, for my clients, for my students, for my family. Right. And that's the big one too. It's like at the end of all of that, like, you know, how, how do you not be an asshole at home? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's so funny. I mean, 
know, it's so funny because my students constantly uh, tell me how patient I am and how they just yes. can't believe that I would be able to sit there listening to them play their twinkles really badly for an hour and just be very calm. And then, you know, so they get this idea of me as this very calm person that's always in control. And I think, you know, if, if you talk to my family and friends, you might not, you might not have that same perspective because, you know, my, I think my clients are often getting like the, the lion's share of my patience and my, you know. And not, I, yeah, and I think yeah. that's, that's where these, <laughs> that's where these practices like really come in and they're yeah. super important because, you know, there's like, there's a way in which I want to show up in my life, yes. uh, regardless yeah. of like who it's for, like for, my, for myself. And of course, um, like foremost, it's for my family, for my friends. Right. So I try to hold myself accountable <laughs> to <not> as <laughs> yes. much as possible and, yeah. <laughs> uh, and to, and to always see, okay, like, am I doing maybe you might maybe trying to do a little bit too much and it's right. like it's starting to affect some yeah. other areas of my life but uh i love nature <laughs> as well and i'm so happy that we're in the best um, city for that right i am so happy that i actually get to enjoy an entire summer this year because houston mm -hmm. in the summer is brutal oh, i can uh, imagine it's the heat i mean it gets hot here too but... no it doesn't <laughs> it's not like, no, it's not like okay. that it's like in the <laughs> 40s and it's the heat is okay actually i mean it's yeah. it's horrible but it's not the worst it's so humid right and um just the idea of uh like, i don't know like watching kids play outside in that weather i'm like how do you even like how do you raise children in the city like <laughs> what do you do with them in the summer but they're fine they're running around and they're totally happy but it's yeah i mean just to have like this nice breeze in the morning now when i go outside it's so beautiful because that I, is nice. i'm about to be in houston in a week and uh, i've already heard reports of oh, like, no, preparing how, how yucky it's gotten get your giant water bottle yeah. <laughs> but it's great drink. for the instruments uh, right i'm always telling my students like your great. instruments yes. love the humidity yeah, the second uh we moved here so we moved here last uh, my husband and i moved here last summer um and then over the course of the fall, we both had um, instrument issues. So my my cello, I have an old cello. Um, it's about 200 probably years old. I don't have a specific oh, date for it. Mine. Mine's like yeah. 100 and something, 120. Not sure. Specific. It's 18 something. Oh, so wow. Um, so so I, think it's, I think it's the late 1800s. Um, and it's an instrument that I bought fairly recently. I got it actually right uh, it was in 2019, I would have yeah. been, yeah, like in the summer, I think, of 2019. And uh, I, I'm like, I'm in love with this instrument still. <laughs> it's like so exciting because I could never find a cello that I really, really love. Oh, that's so nice that you found uh, one that you I love. I'm so lucky. Love I have one that I've always loved. But yeah, it's hard, it's hard to find. Yeah, this was like <laughs> the first cello like that I really, I mean, this was, this is my first cello that um, I had since having my student cellos. I played on borrowed instruments through all of my degrees. Wow. Um, yeah, so mm -hmm. it was like either from a from a friend or yeah. from um, uh, my teacher lent me yeah. a cello for some time. Yeah. So and then finally, it's like okay, I need something. I need something. And I was. Oh, that must down. feel so great. Yeah, the it was. It was like the on. best. <laughs> it was the best <laughs> feeling ever. And um, but when I brought it here, I'm sure like you know, all about old instruments. They're so picky. Sure. It opened yeah. up like everywhere and it's still, oh. like, it's still not back to normal. It <laughs> still needs to have more work done. Have you taken it to like the local Luthier? Do you go to the sound post or Yeah, well else? actually my Luthier is in Montreal. So, oh, okay. Um, yeah. And I've just been delaying a trip. So I want to yeah. go there and like have him. Get it all looked at. Because that's great. yeah, it's not that far away. And I have actually, I have some concerts coming up um, in June. So I'll be going there anyway. So I'm hoping maybe I can. <laughs> nice. Maybe nice. I can do that at the same time. So yeah. So why don't we get to some of these questions? Since yeah. we so much, so much work into the match. I just put these yeah. just down on paper like half an hour. Yes. Ago. <laughs> why don't you start with one of one of yours? Okay. Sure. Well, I'll start with the first one I actually sent to you because yes. I find it absolutely fascinating that we both um, are. Well, actually, we're both in the same city, which is. <laughs> I know. Which is, it was just like a total well, flip. Uncanny, right? <laughs> and yeah, but you work a lot with adults, and I do. So yes. do I, and I absolutely love working with adults, and I have my reasons for it. But I yeah. wanted to hear your perspective. Like, what's yeah. your favorite thing about teaching adults? 
So there's a, a number of things that I love about teaching adults. I think the number one is that a lot of adults um, come to cello. There's two, there's two ways that they come to cello. One is um, they played as a child and then they didn't play for many years, right? And then they're getting back into it later as an adult once their lives have settled down and they're, you know, have, are finding some time and money to do so. And then the other is like somebody who just wants to kind of take it up as like a way to, I guess, personal development or they've always loved the sound of the instrument um, and they wanna, you know, get, get into it. Finally, they have, again, the time and the money, right? Because as you know, to take up a string instrument, you need time, and you need money for a fair, like, you know, I don't need a lot of money, but uh, an, enough to get started, right? It's not a cheap thing. So, so yeah, I, I think teaching adults for me, um, I find that what I really enjoy is like how much it can bring to their, um, just their, their personal development, I guess, like kind of tapping into a part of themselves that sometimes they've neglected for many years. Like a lot of the time I'll have, for example, people who have retired and they want to take up cello as a, a retirement project. And they spent all these years, you know, with their careers and maybe looking after family and they finally have time to do something for themselves. And like one of my favorite types of students to teach would be, um, a retired woman whose family has finally left and she has this time for herself and this is something she's doing just for her and it's so nice because some of those students are my most dedicated they, they sometimes come for two lessons a week you know they really make the time to practice each day and they really get into it and make a lot of progress in a short time and i think that's so neat because i think in like society we sort of have a um i think a belief that like if you're if you don't learn music as a child then it's too late, right, later on. So I, I'm really uh, inspired by the bravery of people to come to something like this that they just know nothing about and say, I'm gonna give that a go. And I just, I find that, I find them inspiring in that in that sense. Yeah, how about you? Why do you like to teach adults? Well, I'll actually uh, piggyback off of the last thing you said because yeah. um, when I jumped into my yoga teacher training, it was um, like I th we were probably about 20 people and like of completely different backgrounds. Um, there was so, I mean, there were a few very dedicated practitioners that were like there because they wanted to learn how to teach. Yeah. Uh, there were a few people that were just doing it to kind of go deeper in their own practice to yeah. maybe get some more anatomy knowledge and then there was me that was like, hey, I, I want to learn anatomy so that I can teach cello better. Yeah. And there was also in my first course, uh, the mother of one of the school's founders, actually, uh, who had been coming to class, but she was not doing it so that she could teach yoga. And it was just, uh, I mean, she was, I think at that point, probably easily the oldest person in the room mm -hmm. um, and not very old by any means. Yeah. Um, but in my second training, that was like a very similar situation. And we also had 15 year olds in both trainings as well. Oh wow. And it was so just this like spectrum, yeah. crazy, yeah, spectrum and uh, people that were there for very different reasons. And, but the thing that was in common is, yeah. for everyone is like, we were sitting there like staring at our new anatomy textbooks <laughs> written in like completely different language. Which right. if you've ever like looked at an anatomy test, I it's like, what been, are these words? I was thinking of going to med school at one point and then I did open up some text. And think, oh my so God. when you first get into it, it's just like, I mean, it's kind of like reading music when you've never read it before. Yes, a different it's language. It's just like a completely different language of all of these symbols. But then yeah. you slowly begin to make sense and you can actually kind of speak it. And then you realize right. that, hey, now I can now can, I can actually express myself so much better right. because I have terminology for these things. Yes. And it was just so fascinating to be, well, for me, it was a little bit unusual to actually all of a sudden be a student, um, not of music. I'd been a music student forever. It was, I was finishing up, I think, one of my degrees, uh, or I had just finished when I started the, my first yes. one. Yes. So I think I was maybe a year and a half out of school, actually. And up until that point, I was always in class for something. I mean, a lot of it was just lessons, but I you know, kind of feel like I'm always learning, but here I was learning about something completely new and it makes you grow in such a different way. Right. And I, from there, uh, developed this, 
uh, well, first, just like crazy respect for people that are willing to pick something up that they know nothing about and just practice and get better. I know. And it's so hard at first, right? The learning yeah. curve can be so Well, and so as big. a as adults, like what happens when we're not good at something? It's like, <gasps> I know, it's, I know. oh, it's not for me. Like, yeah. you know, I, I tried this thing twice and I suck at it. I, it right. It's not for me. I can't do it. Yeah. And I actually have friends that will admit that about themselves. They say, I can't, at this point in my life, I cannot take up something that I'm not naturally good at. Like they, they have just, there's just yeah. a wall there. It's like they can't, I don't know what it is, if it's self-consciousness that we sort of, we, we develop a shame around it and I'm not sure, you know. Or, so, or yeah. is it the work that we have to put in? Because, you know, yeah. if you think about kids um, when they learn anything new, I mean, yeah. they fail so much I all know. the time. I mean, like, it's, you know, yeah, yeah. like trying to put a spoon yeah. in their mouth, it's it takes right. how many months or years to actually for them to be able to do it successfully. <laughs> I know, I know. And if adults so, were trying to do that, they would just yeah. give up and we'd all be sitting on the floor unable to walk. Or just unable to walk, unable to eat, just like, what are we going to do with that? So uh, <laughs> I think, I actually, I think um, we, like, we, act, we need to experience being bad at yes. something yes. in order to grow and yes. to be able to overcome that and still keep going right. and like get better and better right. uh i i learned that pretty late in life just like what that what, what that's that like means, because means, i yeah, yeah it's like yeah. whenever i would try to like music doesn't count i uh, i picked up the <laughs> violin when i was 14 uh and that was kind of like almost as an adult <laughs> Right. It was so late. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was, it's late for those that muscle development. Yeah, and, and it yeah. was it was so funny because yeah. like how easily certain things came, and I was always like that too. It's just like if things didn't come easy, I was sort of like I don't know if I really want to work on it. Yes. And then I was like exposed to this new thing that I wanted so much. I wanted right. to. I mean, it, I wanted to have the knowledge to be able to teach others, and yes. I got to experience like this whole journey of, you know, learning a new skill and seeing... oh, what a great lesson to learn. Yeah. Right? It's a great, and... I think in yoga, yoga practice, they call that like beginner's mind, right? If you can tap into yeah. that idea of just being at the start of something and being okay with that, no matter, no matter where you are in your life journey. Right. And yeah, for just sure. Sitting with that, it's really, uh, I think it's an important lesson for us all. And yeah, like you, I've kind of, I find myself inspired by my students' ability to do that because I didn't, I have found that hard myself. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and I was teaching, something. I was teaching a few adults at that point already and yeah. uh, realized very quickly how, how I needed a different approach than just showing. Mm -hmm. like, mm -hmm. I can't just demonstrate something and they yes. sort of pick it up. You, there, It takes a lot of like explaining, but in a way where, like, how do you explain something so that somebody else can feel it? Like, you yes. kind of can't, yeah. but we can, we can, we can try, and we can find yeah. the, the language to like really describe movement and to be able to show, and all of that together. Um, that that is what initially drove me to like, okay, I need more language. But I was already exposed to like these people that it's like, hey, you're comfortable with just you know not necessarily having it all together yet you, you keep coming to me you keep coming right. taking lessons that's and, amazing uh, yeah. yeah i just <laughs> I have so much respect for people that are willing to do that yes um, i kind of have to pinch myself sometimes i'm like this lady's been coming to me for five years every week religiously practicing it's just like <sighs> it's such an honor in a way because i just feel like this is so yeah because cool. such a cool relationship that we've developed yeah, people people have so little time in their lives and um i yeah. mean kids don't always get to choose how they spend their time right um right sometimes we teach students that their parents want them to be there the kids don't yeah. necessarily and i was one of those students i think at one point i didn't really know if if I, what i was doing was what i oh, wanted to see i, I yeah. know i didn't want to quit but um because I didn't practice very much, so I, I had I was threatened often with lessons. Being I think taken that's away. something else we have in common. <laughs> so, but every time, every time that, that that threat would come, it's like, hey, if you don't practice, we're actually going to take lessons. That would work. I was like, okay, right. so I guess I want lessons. Why? I don't want to practice. <laughs> it's probably about that relationship with your teacher, maybe, or who knows? You know, it feels and, special. I remember feeling kind of special as a child because I played the cello, and there weren't a lot of other people that played the cello. So it was always this thing that made me unique. 
right? So even though I didn't really want to put the work in, I just kept going, right? And then at some point, the internal motivation kicked in. And I think that was probably for me in university. Like, oh, yeah. I was like, okay, it's... maybe I should practice now. Yeah. For me, <laughs> for me, it was my university teachers, for sure, that yeah. kind of awoke this in me. But um, <laughs> yeah, it's just this, so this um, honor of, you know, knowing that somebody chose to spend their time and their money to come to you for an right. hour and to right. listen like that somebody is willing to pay me yeah. for for things that i'm going to tell them for how to do, and then they're gonna and then they're gonna go home and actually do what i say like that, that right? and then they get results yeah. and that's the most <laughs> like for me that's super rewarding but it's just this this uh responsibility also of right um, so yeah you like want to that yeah so you want to get better at that and understand i mean that's why i've done i've done so much teacher training right suzuki teacher training and like you were saying you went back to do your yoga training kind of more than one time and i've done that too with my fundamental cello teaching i've gone back i've done like the suzuki unit one like i think three times now and it's because i i think it's so important at the very beginning to get people set up really really well because i think that beginning you know is where people make the decision whether this is for them or not so if you can get them comfortable in their body and confident like in their journey forward, then that's really, then they'll kind of take it from there, right? But if they're not set up well, they don't feel good about it. I have a lot of adult students that come to me and they, they maybe come from a teacher that didn't help them to set up properly, fundamentally, that the, the teacher was more interested in kind of moving them through the repertoire really fast or, you know, making sure they have a ton of studies. But I can see, you know, they spent a couple of years as a teacher and they still can't, they still don't feel comfortable with their instrument. Mm -hmm. So that's something too that I find that I really enjoy about my job is when someone comes to me and helping them, you know, get comfortable, like feel the cello is like part of them, right? That's something that I really like. That's super important. <laughs> Quest, question for you then. I'll, I'll pull out one of mine um, or another one of mine. Yeah, maybe I'll ask you one. And then yeah, you that's me. true. The yeah. last one was mine. <laughs> as well. I was answering it. <laughs> yeah, no, because like, this kind of goes, this kind of segues from what we were talking about. So when you're teaching adults um, or string, like string players in general, what do you find is kind of the biggest issue that comes up that you can address? from a yogic perspective that you're able to kind of help them with um, that you wouldn't have if you didn't have that background and that training. I love that. So, and there's, <laughs> and there's so much in there for sure. Um, I like to think from like the physical aspect first, because what you were just saying about being comfortable with the instrument. Yeah. Um, about being like set up well before you can really move through all of the repertoire because right. I think think everyone's goal really eventually is we want to get our students playing the pieces that they want to play. Sure. Yeah. Um, I mean, everyone comes you know, with an idea of what they want to play. Yeah. Right? I want to play this yeah. box suite. It's like, okay, great. <laughs> Let's figure out how Five to years from now. <laughs> <laughs> or whenever, but like, yeah, we, whenever we, got, we, we got it. We got to figure out these things yeah. first. Yeah. Um, so I think for string players in general, we have a lot of tension in the shoulders yeah. and for me distinguishing actually what like what the mini movements are because shoulders are like a crazy crazy place you have scapula like the scapular joint which moves actually can move independently of your shoulder and then your shoulder can move inde independently of your scapula but so often the two kind of get conflated and we need to like if you're going to take your arms up overhead and pick something up your shoulder right. blades float up right. and that's, that's normal but we have to be very mindful of how we move especially this area when we play. And some schools of cello teach like higher elbows, for instance. I don't, um, that's not my upbringing, but uh, I see so often that this can come with that and they're completely, yes. they're not related necessarily. Right. But to yes. be able to distinguish this uh, like little thing of it's like everything looks right. Why isn't this working? And to actually be able to see it's like, oh, it's because of this position of this joint. Yes. Or another thing I've been paying attention to recently a lot is like hand shape and setting up hands, like setting up left hand for the very first time with students. Some just like go and right. they're fine. Yeah. And they're just like, 
that's I it. The ball. I'm good. <laughs> yeah. That's it. And, they, and everything. Yeah. And some, I don't know if you've experienced this with some students where it's like, no matter what, it's like either the wrist mm -hmm. does this or like something is very right, the fingers don't yeah. reach. And it's yeah. like, okay, we yeah. compare hand sizes. My hand is the same, if not yeah. smaller. And yet right. I have no trouble reaching. They have trouble reaching. Right. So to actually be able to look at every single joint and see, it's right. like, okay, well, what's the position here? What's the thumb doing? And to be able to look at it like from a purely just like anatomical perspective mm -hmm. has been super helpful for me. And I think for my students as well, because yes. oh, when they imagine. when they can actually understand, it's like, oh, this joint needs to be yes. like this. Yes, I need to take this and make it into this shape. <laughs> yeah, and it's like the metaphors can help, but yes. sometimes they don't. Sometimes, you know, it's like yeah, people true. hold the ball differently. People yes. give a hug differently. All of these things, like they can be useful when you get the right, right. one that works for the student, right. but they can also not portray the same meaning as when we can actually describe things really, really yeah. well. Um, and I think the other thing for me with yoga has been uh, visualization. Okay. Oh, yeah. Mm. Powerful. More powerful mm. than people. Yeah. And, and a, a little lot bit of... hard to get people into, I find. Yeah, I think so. I think adults are a little <laughs> bit more open to it yeah. uh, sometimes than, than, than younger students and than kids, but it depends. Yeah. Um, I, yeah, when I was in Houston, I would, I would take uh, my yoga teachers very hard uh, yoga class twice a week and um, like physically hard yeah like oh, you're like hard. you're dying by every <laughs> it's a, it's a, he calls it a failure failure class so oh, the, the okay. way this goes is that like he teaches what he teaches and until yeah. he starts seeing people failing like uh, you know, we don't stop collapsing on the ground so yeah. you're jumping into oh, handstands wow. until like so everyone's bad. basically dead on the floor <laughs> um and it comes with a warning like everyone in that room is an incredibly strong practitioner everyone knows how to take care of their bodies like right. it's incredibly yeah. safe but because of like because of yeah. the kind of community that's like that he's built up and just right. like, kind of the knowledge extreme yoga there. so um <laughs> But it's a profoundly uh, just like rewarding experience because you get to challenge yourself in a right. way that um, like I'm I'm externally motivated quite a bit. Yeah. And I love my like practices at home by myself, but I I know I won't get to that like level of like just challenging my body if I yeah. if I don't have the external motivation. Yes. <laughs> and I guess it's like something about suffering and <laughs> Oh, I like totally in a large number. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's like with my cello ensemble that a lot of the students uh, practice because they don't want to embarrass themselves in them. front of others. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And I this so I this started happening there where like at the end of the class we're kind of it's almost done and you think it's done. Everyone thinks it's done. It's like you're lying in your back. It's like this like yeah. pool of sweat. And <laughs> and it's like okay. We, he walks us through our little relaxation and then, okay, close your eyes and just like pick whatever was hard for you during the class or it'll be a specific thing. It's like, and just can you visualize yourself like now doing it perfectly and effortlessly and like, what does it feel like? And like, hang on to that and then like, show me. Nice. And so nice. this is like 90 minutes later after yes. of like, <laughs> And it's amazing how after that, just those few moments of mm -hmm. really, you get that little break, you're exhausted, you're on the floor, you're, and you've imagined this thing perfectly. And miracles don't necessarily happen, but you go and you do it, and yeah. there's just always so much more ease yes. when you do it. And so I started doing that more and more with my playing, especially preparing for things and just mental practice and... Mm -hmm. I think for performances is where it's very powerful. Yeah. I might, I myself, the first time I remember like kind of formally using visualization, I've done it before, but kind of an informal way was when I wanted to audition for the performance program at UT. So I was in like the general music first year program. And mm -hmm. I knew I had some, cause I didn't practice. I knew I had some work to do to get into the performance program. So like, this was the year I was going to do it. And be just before I had that audition, I sat down and I wrote probably like three pages of what it was going to look like exactly and what it was going to feel like, you know, when I played really well. And it was, it was powerful stuff. Like when I sat down to play, like I felt just more focused than I've ever felt performing like before that point. 
in my life. And that's where I really became kind of a true believer, you know, in the power of just like mentally seeing what it is, you know, and obviously I've done my preparation, I practice like yeah. crazy, but you know, at that point in my life, like I was a very anxious player. Sometimes I would have a great performance and then another time it would just be a total bomb. Right. And I knew that I had to kind of like figure out how to be more consistent, right. When I performed and that was a huge, huge tool for me to kind of be able to get out of my mind and more into my body. Be in the yeah, moment. yeah. That consistency was a big deal for me as well, because yeah. um, when you're in school, I think you're sort of in a bit of a safe bubble. Yeah. Um, everyone has off performances every once in a while and before university, like I always had the odd one that actually probably more than I'll even care to admit, like <laughs> mishaps of yeah, me usually, too. usually they were all <laughs> caused by just lack of preparation because I just, yeah. I didn't know how. Yeah. Um, same here. I didn't, and I didn't have good guidance. I, I didn't even have a fellow teacher. <laughs> yeah, it, it wasn't for the lack of hours practicing actually. Yeah. At one point it was, I was really putting in the time where what should have been enough time um but yeah. without really understanding this like the steps and i had a bunch of um like i had i had a quite a few different cello teachers and different music teachers in general yes. in my time and i definitely especially as i kind of selected my own who i studied with i i got more and more value from those people uh that i was able to implement but i think it had i had already had so long like just i had there had been so much time that had gone by without me really understanding how to structure practice, how to prepare for an event, right? how to like really like that. It's not just about, okay, if I practice like an hour and a half or two hours a day, then by the time this comes around, I'll be ready. It's like, that's nonsense. No, it doesn't work at all. In fact, you can make it worse for yourself because yeah. you might be just practicing the wrong thing over and over in the wrong way. Yeah. And just, <laughs> and just like realizing yeah. that, Oh, yeah. well, you know, we can set goals and we can set milestones and we can yeah. actually like understand that if you're going to play, I don't know, competition or audition on this day, this is what a week before needs to look like. Right. This is what a month before needs to look like. Right. This is like a kind of steps you need to be taking, not just like, I'm just going to keep practicing every day until the days run out. Yeah. <laughs> and then all of a sudden I'm just going to get on the stage. And, the and a miracle is going to happen. And usually not because it's a no. new, it's a new environment. No you're miracles ready for it. You're freaked out. Yeah, there's hot lights on you. Yeah, and, like you and I think that. like that that just I mean that <laughs> left left um, a big imprint. Even yeah, uh, I mean just a little bit of trauma. I think yeah. uh, just yeah. a little bit of that, and I lost my train of thought. <laughs> I, like, I, I just I was back I was back in like a few in my like high school moments. Like, oh, this no, is we like, were just talking about preparing and the, the power of visualization to prepare for an event and uh, practicing properly. Yeah, and how important that is, and that's something that I learned later in life also. And I think I learned it really well through my teacher training. I mean, life experience, but also having that formal. This is how you teach a person, and these are the steps to get them from here to here. I mean, that was something that I was so you know, completely unaware of. Like, I didn't even have a cello teacher, an actual cellist. I had a viola player who was my teacher until mm -hmm. I did my auditions for university. So even having a cello teacher that had some kind of formal yeah. training, you know, it was because almost like being self taught. Of, yeah, all of my <laughs> um, early, uh, like early delvings into teaching, it was yeah. just trying to really remember, like, how was I, I how was I taught? Like, right. how did I start these things? Yes. Uh, I actually went and observed. I was in, uh, this was many, many years ago. I was in Russia for the summer. Um, I'm from St. Petersburg. And um, I went and saw my first cello teacher. I actually watched her teach a class to oh, wow. like, a complete beginner. And that was like, I wish I could have just spent more time observing those lessons yeah. because um, it it's the school that I come from, like, that the background that I have. So right. just kind of being able to revisit yeah. uh, that method was to see where you came from. Interesting. Yeah. 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 Um, that's funny. <laughs> Shall we go to the, that other question you wanted to ask? Yeah. Me? So I wanted to ask that's you, because while we're still on the subject of pedagogy, yeah. I wanted to ask you what you think, um, like what you think is missing from 
traditional music pedagogy? A few things. <laughs> yeah, <I'm sure. laughs> a lot. Uh, starting with women, <laughs> I think a lot of what we have learned, I think, as cellists, um, like the traditional pedagogy of like the 1900s was, I think, physically um, made for men who had much bigger hands than women. So even just the idea of like how you place your hands and play. So say for example, um, your hand, like the left hand, I teach, and um, maybe you learned this method too, I teach like a movable thumb method. So you put your thumb on the back, but then as you move around, your thumb will move to support the fingers that are playing. So the way that I was originally taught, I was taught, I think what it's called is the square hand. You put your thumb in one spot. Some people even have a dot like right on the back of their instrument. You put your thumb there and it doesn't move. Like if you're first position, that's where your thumb is. It never moves. Um, and like what that created for me, because I did learn like that at the beginning was I felt like there was all this tightness in my hand all the time mm -hmm. because my thumb was in one spot. I felt like it always had to be there. And then if I moved to another position, it would like squeeze and I would move down the instrument. So pedagogically, uh, and I learned this from my teacher, Shauna Rolson. She, ta she taught me this. She sort of taught me that like, a, she called it independent fingers. So the thumb and whatever finger is going to be playing, they need to support each other. And I think another word for it would be a balanced hand, which is similar to what Rukmini teaches, um, that that hand needs to stay free and flexible and able to move around as opposed to let's put it in one spot and just leave it there. So that I think is missing from our pedagogy because I think still the old way is taught a lot. I think a lot of people think you put your thumb here. I have students that show up and they've got like their teacher put a dot on the back. This is where the thumb goes. It never, it never moves up from mm -hmm. that spot. And I'd like to immediately take that away and kind of talk about, you know, how the hand works and what's going to feel better. Um, so that's one thing I think is missing. Um, and, you know, kind of going on that theme of like classical music in general was like sort of a man's world for a lot of, a lot of, um, you know, history. So the music, the music as well. So like when you teach, when you learn classical music, um, often you're going to be learning pieces written mostly by white men, um, you know, from a certain time period. So I've really had to be very conscious about um, making sure that the music that my students are is, are learning it kind of comes from a more a broad broad perspective as opposed to let's just learn this classical music from this period, right? And that's all we're going to play. So kind of opening up. Um, their just their perspectives and, and and actually my students have taught like that's another reason why you get back to why I love teaching adults like adults will come with like I want to learn uh, Irish folk music or I want to learn pop tunes or I want to learn metal and when I was a beginning teacher that used to kind of make me nervous because I had this really strict classical background I'm like oh but I only teach you know pop or whatever <laughs> and so I really had to like expand my world um, to help with that. So I think the the music needs to, I think our classical training, and, and I think this is happening. I'm seeing it in teacher circles where people are just trying to, you know, be a more uh, broad with like what what the music that people are learning, what it is and, and how they play it, right? So I think that's missing, though getting better. Um, I think also creativity. For me, that's a big one. And it's really interesting because I think people think of music as this really creative field. But I don't know if you found this in your training. A lot of the time when I was learning, it was like, I get a piece of music and I play it as I'm told. Uh, and there's really just a lot of like rote learning, right? This is how it's done. Uh, somebody would tell me how the dynamics are, how you're gonna express it. And there wasn't a lot of choices, really. You'd get a teacher and that teacher would tell you how to play something. Um, and me being kind of like, I've always been a little bit like my own, a little bit alternative doing my own thing. I was kind of came up again, like that was a bit of a clash for me. You know, when I was a teenager, I started writing songs and I was being creative that way. And then trying to kind of reconcile that with this, what I kind of perceived as a very strict classical world, very hierarchical, like people are on the top and they're telling people below what to do. Um, that's something that I really kind of intuitively wanted to break down. So I really, <laughs> really try with my students to get them thinking about themselves as the ultimate creative authority on the music that they play. It's not me telling you how to play this. 
I might have like I have lots of knowledge and lots of learning. Um, but ultimately, the choices that you're going to make and like all their choices down to like how they move their bodies and what they play, those choices are there, are theirs to make and not mine. Uh, I think that's somewhat missing still from like the old, the old school of teaching. Does that, uh, does that make sense? Oh, yeah. No, agreed. Yeah. I, I, I was hoping you were going to talk about like the creativity aspect. Yeah. But I know you do a lot of improv and I think you teach it. Yes, I do. Yeah. Yes. And I think yeah. that's fantastic. And that's, that's something that I hope to begin to incorporate in the next. Yeah. Year. Yeah. That's something maybe we can chat more about at some point. Do you, do you improvise? In your no, I, so I played with uh, two friends uh, when I was living in Montreal, we had a, we had a group, the group yeah. still exists. Uh, it's called Bolero. Oh, and cool. it was, yeah. So it was guitar, violin and cello. And we, yeah. we, we would play in the subway, like in the Montreal Metro. Oh, awesome. And this is how I made my living for years. Um, <laughs> and so, yeah. And so it was, it was a um, hassle to like bring a chair. So I would just play standing up all the time. Oh, and this was in the days where I wore like heels like this every single day. So you just have your cello just yep, like this log like, in pin. No, yeah, no and, box strap or anything. <laughs> and I don't, no, that was the thing before the box strap. Even yeah, it was invented later, right? <laughs> and I struggled so much with just not being able to... Um, Kind of to jump on, jump in and just figure something out if I didn't have the music. Yes. Uh, but that's where I did also start to learn to slowly yeah. figure things out mm -hmm. and, and occasionally come up with like a little counter melody here and there. And uh, but it was not intuitive and it was very stressful. And right. ultimately, it was just a lot of learning okay. parts and memorizing yeah. and yeah. Uh, not really delving into that. Um, yeah. So I'm taking, I saw you had posted about the Indian course and that, yeah. so I took, I took that. I have to catch up on the video still because I was yeah. able to make the first one, but not the others. And it's already just like sparked just some ideas of how I can be incorporating these things and- To approach um, that creative aspect. Yeah, it's hard for me because um, I have, I feel like I have limited time to actually sit down and practice. And when mm -hmm. I do, I, I feel like there are things that I, like specific things I want to be working towards. So to actually make that commitment, right? Um, to make time regularly to yeah. do something else. Yeah, um, I think of it like play. Like, uh, I mean, I think that's really with anything creative. I think if you can approach it from, you know, trying to get yourself in that childlike state where it's not about what it's going to look like or the end result. It's mm -hmm. more just about like, what can I do now? Right? right. Like, what fun stuff can I do? Like, that's... And we're so judgmental and we're so self-critical. It's like, oh, that yeah. sounded terrible. That was wrong. <laughs> yeah, I know. And I, and I would never that... say that to my student, right? No. Like, and you would never say that to your student. And like, yeah. why do we talk to ourselves yeah. this way? Yeah. Um, yeah. So I'm, I'm excited to explore that. That is exciting. There's a woman, do you know Laura Nuremberg? She's a violinist. I do. I yeah. do. I'm actually, and I would like to check out her. Yes, you should explore yes. her, her whole thing. Cause she's what, uh, she's a creative ability development teacher. So she teaches teachers, classical teachers to help them teach their students how to improvise. And through that process, you learn how mm -hmm. to improvise because you do all of the things that you would be doing with your students right so i did like a workshop with her and it was really amazing because it was a bunch of just mostly classical teachers with some varied improv experience like i was probably the most comfortable improviser there um but some people had none and we just kind of went through these games that you can do and ways to approach it and that was great both from a point of view of like the teachers learning and then you know being able to pass it down to your students so if you ever get a chance to check out her yeah. stuff no take thanks for bringing that up because i was actually thinking about um, yeah no, she's, one of, she, she's I think she has great. something coming up actually yeah i think i, I think might have missed it i don't think so it's okay she'll have something else she's always yeah great. i think i should really check yeah. it out because she, I yeah have, she does like free jams and stuff as well so that could be fun. I, I have a couple of students actually also that are just spontaneously creative and yes i really want I, to nurture that you want to nurture and, it yeah and not be like no, now we have to play like, yeah, <laughs> play first finger. <laughs> and from that physical point of view too, I was, I'm going to say that once I started improvising and feeling free on my cello, a lot of the technical issues that I've had and body issues actually started to kind of just go away on their own. Because when you sort of approach some of these things from like a play point of view and an experiment, and you're not mm -hmm. so 
focused on that, like, oh, it's it's fast and high and hard and has to, has to sound like this, I found myself playing things that I would, if I saw them on a page, I'd be completely freaked out. This is really hard. It's too hard. But yeah. when I, I just found myself doing it, it was so much easier. And then that kind of like, um, just it transitioned into being able to play some of that harder, higher classical stuff, realizing that I actually could. I just was like, there was like a mind block there. Right? So that's what I found with the creativity. It kind of helps to break through some of these blocks that people have um, about like the written music. And so for me, it was a pathway to like better technique. Yeah, no, I think I think that makes perfect sense. Yeah. And I think until recently, I mean, it was so common for for performers to yes, compose right. their own cadenzas to like right. It's something we've gotten and away from. And yeah. even like um, when you play Baroque music, it's expected that you can ornament. Yeah. And so in a sense, right. it's just it's where we've gotten to today. Like that's not even necessarily classical music. I think no, in I the don't think times so. Of yeah. classical music, most I think most performers actually could improvise. Yes. I could be I wrong think, on that. I'm not very No, good. no, in that period but, of time they could. It was I mean, part of the practice. Uh they would have so been common. trained in that yeah. um from the very beginning. They were all learning to compose. They're all yeah. improvising. Yeah, it's something we got away from, I think, because we sort of created this like copy of a copy of a copy where people just, you know, there's there's been these great these great musicians throughout history. And when we started recording them and then watching them, people wanted to just do what they did because it was working, right? Yeah. But then it's just become this kind of like... Um, I mean, it's not it's not interesting anymore. <laughs> have, you know, yeah, it's repetition. You have right? the same thing. And, yeah. and I mean, at the same time, there are going to be pieces that I will never tire of, of playing. Of and, course. You know, I don't think we should stop doing that. Yeah. But I think we've definitely become very like single-minded of like, yeah. Like you are a performer or you are a teacher or you are like yeah and it's like all of these labels where in fact it's all like, kind of one like just <laughs> who are you and the more right. things that you can do and the more like the more that you can kind of yeah. offer and embrace i think the better yeah um, for sure i struggled actually i had like an identity issue around this for a while because i uh, started university as a double major in okay. violin and cello performance oh wow that's a lot. And <laughs> and the I think one of the reasons that I ultimately like just stuck with cello was because this uh, like belief that you cannot be two things. Um, like yes. coming a lot from the outside and yes. then eventually like yes. me believing that like I can't actually do this. Yes. Because like society says I can't. Yeah. Well, I think we live in the age of specialization, right? And almost like to the point of like, it's, it's weird. It's like, you have to be so specialized in one area to the detriment of like everything else. Yeah. And like, life. and for me to begin to teach, uh, to teach yoga and I struggled, uh, the last, uh, few years with this like desire to like, I want to work with musicians. It's like, I know what I've done to help myself in my body. Like yeah. I know like the things that I've struggled with physically. Yeah. I know what I, what helps my students. Yeah. But to actually come out as I am now a yoga teacher that teaches musicians, there was a part of me that was actually, it's like, how does that look from the point of view from my like professional musician colleagues? <laughs> because okay, like, yeah. am I, am I now like, no longer a cellist because of this. And that's where oh I was like, God. I got so much in my head. Yeah. About well, I think this, personally like, it's super cool. <laughs> yeah. Right? No, but, and yeah. I, I worked out of that and it's, I could realize it's like, no, this is nonsense. Like who says yeah. we have to be one thing? Yeah. And um, this was kind of the beauty of the whole pandemic and being able to embrace like different, uh, different roles and doing different things. Right, and different personas. I now consider yeah. myself a business person and I know, we do. a lot about business and I never <laughs> would have used that title. Even though, you know, as a as a teaching musician, I've always been a business person because to be a freelance musician, you're always, you know, seeking students or looking for jobs, freelancing and getting your networking and you're thinking about gigs. It's all business. Right? But I never would have like labeled it like that because I have like this idea of what business is. And you have to be doing business what, type thing. What did you call yourself? Uh, just I would have just called myself a freelance musician, which I am. So that's yeah, definitely like 
Freelance, right? self-employed. <laughs> yeah, self-employed freelance musician. And that is definitely part of my identity, but I'm also now, I consider myself a course creator and business person, like an entrepreneur. Uh, and so I've kind of, you know, expanded my idea of how I label myself. I realized that um, I was, I wanted to change my website to reflect like the different aspects of what I do. Yeah. And I was consulting with some people in the yoga world. And one person like brought up this really interesting thing. It's like, well, like, do you really need to label yourself? Like, do you really need to identify? Right. Like, do you have to identify with any of these things? And it's like, do I? Yeah. And then I realized that I don't. So I, I mean, I do all of these things and I love all of these things dearly. Right. I don't know who I would be without them, but yes. Um, but at the end of the day, I think I would still be able to bring some sort of value if, even if I could no longer play cello or teach yoga, and, like if all of my limbs, right. all, you know, right, of course. Like, with all that experience and, and life and yeah, learning. So yeah. That, yeah. that was, that was a bit of a breakthrough of just yes. being, being free to like create whatever I want to create. Right. And like let go of like like self-judgment or yes. like worrying about what other people are going to think yeah so. yeah yeah i've been kind of on that journey as well definitely when you start putting you're putting yourself out, out online out there you do i mean some people will say things that are like you know what is it you're doing and it gets a little bit scary for, for sure generally i've had like a really great response so i've been pleased with like the positive energy that's come back towards me, but I'm still always a little bit scared of like how people are going to, what they're going to think of me, like telling them about what I'm doing, you know, inviting them to my workshops. <laughs> <laughs> tell me about your workshop. I know yeah. this is not one of the questions, but tell me. No, about no, no, no. Yeah. So, um, so the cello yoga workshop. So this is how I kind of started getting into this online world of like working with cellists online. Um, I knew for a long time, like, like kind of like you through my own journey of like figuring out what was working for me as a cello player um, and uh, kind of bringing together my practice, like meditating practice and kind of my, I guess, my spiritual practice through yoga and wanting to sort of put those two things together and be able to share it with people. Because I, I realized that there was a lot of people out there when I just started talking to students, a lot of people that were really struggling with just kind of the, I, what I call the athleticism of the cello, like the, like the physical aspects of how you do what you do on the instrument, right? How, uh, I think as musicians, we often, um, I used to think of myself as like not an athletic person at all, like not in any way good at sports or good at gym or whatever. Um, but through like, um, you know, exper experimenting with my own body and finding out what works for me on the cello, I was able to put together these two ideas and then share them with other people to help them with things like tension and pain and anxiety and performance stress and all these things that are essentially affected by sort of how you're approaching the instrument, not just physically, but kind of spiritually as well, like the energy that you're bringing. So for me, it's maybe a little bit less about the physical things that you do on the cello are very important, but there's also this like these aspects of like mindfulness and mm -hmm. mindful practice. And like when you sit down with your instrument, uh, what are you focusing on? And how do you get to a place where you can kind of focus on just one thing at a time and put those pieces together in a way that doesn't cause overwhelm and, and respects your body, right? So that you don't feel, I used to feel after I practiced for a long time, like, I would feel worn out and sometimes sore and that's not necessarily a bad thing but you want to be careful right because sometimes that soreness can be an indicator that you're doing something that's not quite right for your body and sometimes it can be like oh i just worked really hard so i wanted to um at the beginning of the pandemic i sort of saw like an opportunity to connect with people online and i just put out the word like hey i'd like to do this workshop and a bunch of people were like yeah i'd love to come so that was really surprising because at first like well, I don't know who's going to come to this weird thing, <laughs> but I had like a bunch of people come to it. And then I just kind of worked through a few um, like things that I did on my instrument to help people with their setup and to feel more comfortable and some of the, the creative improvised based things that I use to help them like work through their physical and mental blocks. And people just love that. So after that, I, I basically asked people, do you want me to make a course about this? 
And the people were like, mm -hmm. yes, make us a course. <laughs> so I did. I made a course, which is now like an on-demand on course that people can to buy and kind of work through, right? And if they want more help, they can book a session with me and we can kind of get more one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, but I found it was fascinating to me how many people resonate with that kind of joining together of those practices, right? Practice of kind of mindful spiritual meditation, um, being aware of your body, and then also like the musical aspect. And that was just so neat to find that there really is like a, like a, quite a lot of people, a community around just those concepts when you put them together. Because like you, I was thinking these are very separate things, but then when you start to put them together, it's actually not at all. It's all connected. So yeah, so I've been doing those. I've had three of those workshops and I'm trying to do them kind of semi-regularly every couple of months and just like focus on different topics each time that will be helpful to, to, to cellists uh, from uh, different perspectives. And I, as you know, I have a group online that's got a bunch of people and I kind of ask them like, what do you want me to do in the next workshop? So that I take their mm -hmm. ideas and then yeah. put them into the workshop so we can get those, uh, those questions answered for people. Yeah, so that's what my workshops kind of look like. That's awesome. I think my first yeah. like um, experience of like flow state and what meditation is was actually through cello first. Oh, that's so uh, neat. Yeah, I it, think maybe maybe me too if I really think about it. And it now it just makes so much sense to be connecting them. Yes. And if we go back to like pedagogy, I think. Yes. This is for me one of the things that's like really missing as well uh, oh, is like mindfulness and like actual practice, like techniques. Yes. And the joy in those things, I yeah. think, too. And that, like, yeah, that just the cultivation of like patience. And we talk, there's so much talk about hard work. I don't like those yeah. words. Like, no, they're very I, stressful. I, yeah, like <laughs> hard and work. Like, I know. they're not words I, I want to like relate with. And yeah, I think like dedication and commitment. Yeah, and um, like I love to empower my students to like have the tools to be able to like achieve whatever they want. And you can just say it, you know, hard work. But I think it's very different when you can actually approach it from like more of a mindfulness perspective. With, yes. Yeah. I mean, I think, for example, just like tone creation, I think um, like the way that I was taught, you know, I, I went through like the Royal Conservatory of Music system and they have scales mm -hmm. and the technique and then you have your studies and you have your pieces and those things were all kind of presented as very discrete things. And generally speaking, most people didn't want to practice scales and they didn't want to do studies because that stuff was boring. And then like the pieces were really what you wanted to do. And it was even reflected in the marking system, right? You get the most marks for the pieces and then the other stuff is like less marks. Um, and I think whether that's intentional or not, but the message that was created there was like technique is boring and hard and nobody wants to do it. And the pieces are where the fun's at. Yeah. Right? But what I try to do through my teaching is kind of help people understand, like, when you sit down with your cello, even playing just like one note, you, know, you can play one note for five minutes, and it can be just this most beautiful thing that feels good, that sounds good, you know, a, dr a drone, right? Like, just play a drone and and feel yourself like hear what's going on feel what you, what's going on in your body take that time to release the tension uh it's still something i think a lot of my students don't quite get but i do you know some of them have really taken that to heart and again why i like adults because they're more likely to kind of get that like yes if i play this note for a long time i'm gonna get something out of it whereas you ask a five year old that, that's yeah. I'm the same way. It's just like, <laughs> and I mean, you have nowhere to be for me. Like yeah. right now, uh, yeah. when I sit down, I actually love not having to prepare something for something like right now, like next week. Right. Yeah. So to actually just be able to sit and play really slow tones with a drone and yes. like, I'm still learning a piece. Maybe yes. I'm probably not just like playing random notes, even yeah. though, although sometimes it's nice to do just like open strings for tone production, but like I'm pick, I, I decided to um, bring back the fourth box suite 
and you oh, know, nice. how like notorious that is for intonation. Oh yeah, yeah. For real. Yeah, I'm actually practicing that now right now because a student asked me once to learn it and like, better learn it. Oh, <laughs> I get, that, that, this is that's the suite I, I did. Um, I did my undergrad recital with. So not all of it, but I played wow. two of them, I think, for my undergrad recital. And I know that back then I did not know about practicing with drones, or at least yeah. like not how to really do it. Yes. So yes. I'm not sure that I even want to go back and listen to recording. I mean, I did well on that recital, but yeah. um, I I just, I wish I had, like, I, I had this knowledge back then. Yeah. Oh, me too. I was so stressed about that whole recital because it's like, I can't play this in tune. I can't. Like I don't even, I wasn't sure how I would memorize it, and I right. I memorized things easily, and I did even back then. But um, and I actually don't think I had any memory slips. But it was it's a hard one to memorize. Oh my gosh, yeah, because there's not a lot of patterns, and it's strange. And the patterns sometimes like yeah, they like they they are just a little bit different than before, yes. and the fingering is super important. Yeah. If you just like shift to the wrong, yeah. um, shift to the wrong note, all of a sudden, it's like or shift to the wrong position with the same note, it's like but the rest doesn't work. Right. And I have notes running through my head when I when I play. Like I always know what note I'm playing. Yeah. So sometimes my brain is just like, okay, B flat. And so I'm on B flat. And it's like, you're on the wrong finger on B flat, but I don't know that. <laughs> so then, <laughs> what am I doing? Um, <laughs> so just like right now, being able to go back through those pieces and enjoying it, enjoying just one sound at a time. Yes. I always love to go back to Bach, and I think many cellists feel that way. There's just there's just worlds in there, right? You know, just worlds of different sounds and harmonies. So um, we might get some background violin. I, I, I was hearing that. I, 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 I hope we're okay. No, no, that's fine. That's cool. I don't, I don't know how the mic is, but I think it'll be a suitable background. <laughs> yeah. so I got one more question for you on my in my list if I could ask. Yeah, sure. I don't know whose turn it is, but. <laughs> I was going to say, what advice would you give a player that tends to think too much when they practice? I'm sure you have students like this. Mm -hmm. They're like analyzing every little thing and they're getting super confused, left hand, right hand, and they just feel overwhelmed in their mind. Well, that's me. I'm, <laughs> I'm not good at that. Yeah. So what advice do you give them? Put it in a good way. So um, I, lo I love the question. I love that you asked it. Um, I think thinking is actually, thinking and analyzing is a really important part of practice that we often overlook. Yeah. And we just like want to do everything. Just, we just want to play all the time. And right. especially younger students, they just like want to play it and try it and try it. And it's like, wait, but try this first. Like, think about that. And remember, put, like, put your finger down, like first, like let's think there's an order of operations here. You can't just like play. Like, yes. no, I just wanna... We're and not just gonna wing this. And it's funny how many adults I think are the same where yeah. they actually just like, they just want to play the music. Yeah. And we want that instant gratification. Yeah. So, but of course we still get the student that overthinks things and yes. I have my share. Yes. And I think mostly it's not even so much an issue of just like thinking too much um, during practice. It's, it's more like being in your head when you're actually playing. So right. I like to always emphasize, it's like, okay, we need to stop and do the thinking and analyze. But yes. like when you're playing, you can't like be concentrating on so many things at the same time. We can't multitask. No, like, it's not a thing. I tell my students we cannot. We you have cannot. to no, it's you have to make a, one thing automatic and then delete. Yeah. And yeah. as much as it, as there is this pressure in our society that we yeah. have to multitask all the time, all you're doing when you're multitasking is that you're just constantly switching tasks and right. losing time. A bunch of stuff badly. Each one, <laughs> a bunch of stuff badly, and that 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 like. Yeah moment yeah. when you switch from one task to the next yes. like that eats up so much time and energy yeah that it just doesn't work yeah so i'm all about layering yeah. and like focusing on one thing at a time solving one problem at a time so if they're yeah. thinking too much like okay well what are they thinking about right i have one student that um sometimes has a like, fantastic player like yeah fantastic high school student and yeah. um like set to be like to go the professional route and oh amazing um before he plays it's it's just like starting is the hardest part okay yeah and so i'll ask him it's like 
okay, pause after, you know, yeah. it's been like a minute that I was like, okay, you may begin. And it's like a minute later and it's the like bow to string. No, bow to string. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> so it just goes on. And, and it's like, well, what, what's going on? Like, what is going through your mind? It's like thinking, thinking about what? Yeah. Thinking about the piece. Okay. What are you thinking about the piece? <laughs> Yeah. Like what are like what can you possibly be thinking about? And I think we get like actually a little bit uh, overwhelmed mm -hmm. with how much there is in a piece of music, mm -hmm. and it can be daunting to just mm -hmm. start because you think there how how am I going to take of all, care of all of these things right. that I have to do? Right. So, okay, well, it's one thing at a time. So right. my advice for uh, for this particular student and then for any student that it just has a tendency it's like yeah you can only influence what's happening right now right you can only influence how this note sounds right so you thinking about the shift that's in two lines and yeah. as a result yeah. everything that's happening before this is a jumble right and it's super easy it's yeah like, the other thing is like how often do we do we sacrifice quality on the simple things? Right. At, because we are so. It's true. You know, sometimes we don't even part. practice the e the so called easy part, yeah. and it ends up not being easy because you never played it. <laughs> I mean, a piece, a piece can have uh, a piece can have like one yeah. really tricky spot. Yeah. And you will be so concerned with it and thinking about it so much that you completely neglect. Right. Take care of the things that you can, like that yeah. you are very capable of taking care of. Yes. And then in the big scheme of things, well, what happens when you do get to that whatever shift? Probably it's always a shift. Isn't it's it? always a shift, yeah. Or a <laughs> string <laughs> crossing. Yeah. Or both. Like, yeah, yeah. Na shift. One of those nasty ones. <laughs> right. So what happens when you get there? It's like, well, if you've done, if you've really been present for every single thing that's come up until that moment. Yeah. For one, the likelihood of you actually succeeding with the next thing, because what well, you've just been practicing presence for however long you've been playing for. Yeah. You've been, right. you've been in the moment this entire yes. time. You've probably been in a state of flow. And so it's just normal and yeah. natural that It'll this thing that you're so maybe worried about or were worried about yeah. us is just going to happen. But even if it doesn't, it's like you just, played so well for what yeah. two, five minutes, 10 minutes, I don't know, what, whatever you're playing, right? And then you have this like one itty bitty moment in time that nobody's going to remember. And there's a, um, I have a lot of respect for like students and for like, musicians in general, because I experienced this, like we want to be happy with the job that we did. Yes. So if, if we really care about this one spot, like yes. it's important to me when I perform, it's important to me that I felt good about my performance Yeah. more. And I don't know if this is like a selfish thing to say, mm -hmm. but for me, that's more important than to have any amount of praise from the audience. Oh, absolutely. Um, yeah. The two things almost aren't connected. No. I've had performance where performance where people would come up and just give me all the praise and I felt terrible inside and also, I was just like I screwed up this and this and, you know well and also <laughs> also being able to actually understand like accept that as yeah. as true like yeah. I know this was a good performance I know the audience That's got good. what they wanted out of it I know I got my point across yeah like I can feel good from that perspective of like having delivered but I set out right. with like one of the things on my agenda was to, I worked on this thing and I wanted to put it in action. I wanted to test it out and it didn't quite work. Right. So for me, it's like, I've, I've started, I've started being a little bit more, um, like I treat it all like a research project now. So I, I, I try not to get, I try not to really get upset about, about yeah. little things like that. I'm, I'm also yeah. like past like disastrous performances that used to, you know, really, <laughs> Yeah, oh, I yeah. <laughs> I know I totally, a remember remember I lost my train of thought like an yeah, hour yeah, ago. Yeah. Oh, you remember now? Okay. I remember now. <laughs> and well this this feeds in actually because you you yeah. were talking about consistency. Yes. And inconsistency in practice and just like how performances used to be all over the place. And um what happened was when I got out of school and started actually working professionally, I realized that it's like it's sort of my job to not mess up. 
Yeah, like, just a little bit. Like it's my job to play in tune yeah. in time yeah. to like come in at the right time. It's it, right. all of a sudden this was a completely different right. uh, level of responsibility yeah. and mindset. And I had to change the way I practice because yeah. it couldn't just be like, well, maybe I won't have a good day. It's like I had to have a good day, but I was hired. And people paid money to come better see suckers. this performance. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, better suck in. It's like I'm not allowed <laughs> to, not allowed to play below a certain standard, and right. like that was crazy stressful, but at the same time really motivating. Yes, and <laughs> I love it. And so this kind of feeds into this, uh, in this yeah. as well, into this yeah. as well, and um, yeah. being in your head and how much that prevents us from just doing the thing. Right. Because ultimately, like what you said about putting things on autopilot, because yeah. I teach my students the same thing. So we yeah. layer, it's like, yeah. you can break things down until it's just the bow, right. maybe just an open string, maybe pizzicato right. if it's left hand. I mean, I, I, yes. you know, I feel like we do the same thing. It's just like, yeah. we, can create, oh, yeah, sure. we can create a million exercises from a simple passage yeah. where let's just work on string crossings. Let's yeah. just work on bow distribution. Let's just work right. on dynamics. And then when you're really good at each one, you can start to put more put them and together. you don't have to think about all of them yeah. at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. And that's where you still ultimately at the end of the day, like you can think all you want, but until you do things by feel, because it's a tactile thing playing. Mm -hmm. It's and a, it's a and it's a feeling thing. Like if you want to actually yeah. get emotions happening, then you're yeah. gonna have to stop thinking. You have to <laughs> you have to like yeah. figure out like what do you want to get across to your audience? Convey. What kind of emotions yeah, what do you want yeah. to convey? What emotions do you want them to maybe experience? Yeah. What emotions do you experience? What was the composer experiencing? Like any of those questions, but um yeah. I like to think of this as like taking somebody on a journey and maybe it contradicts a little bit of what I said with when I perform, if this is from a technical perspective, I think like I care about like my own little agenda sometimes, like for me, what was like, what is a successful performance for me? It's like, did my science experiment work? Basically, right. I practice this thing in a certain way. Was I able to do it the way I wanted? That's my yeah. little science experiment, but the performance is not for me. That's just like, that's my part of it, right? So yeah. what I'm really, what I'm really there for is to take the audience on a journey. And that's the same for my students. And I don't care if your audience is your dog <laughs> or you're, you have to like, you have to take somebody by the hand and like lead them lead through them. this piece and be like, Hey, yeah. look at this. I really love this part. And like, like right. let's go here. And it's like, I don't like this part very much, but you have to look at it as well. <laughs> Like, this one's not pretty. <laughs> like maybe it's a little rainy here today, but <laughs> but it's it. like we're gonna go through this whole like little process that. and yeah, um, just coming back to doing this thing with your hands because yes. we can, like, which is the coolest thing. We sort of know how the brain delivers signals to like our fingers. Like yes, we actually we know all of this. Yeah, we know which muscles yeah. activate. But how do you actually make it happen? Like, we can't answer that question. No, it's magical, really. It's like, there's, <laughs> yeah. we know which, how, we know how muscles work. We know yeah. how, like, yeah. the signals happen. Okay, but, like, how do you actually play this piece of music? How do you put all of that together? Yeah. Um, and so it, it comes down to, like, think about it all you want, but you have to just do the thing. Deliver it. it. Again, and again, yes. and again. Yeah. And rep rep repetition, because, uh, until we get to a certain number of reps, like quality has to almost come secondary. That's right. Like yeah. I'm all for quality, but yeah. we need like when we're building a new skill, we need the quantity. Mm -hmm. and, if, and if we're too frozen, like too afraid to move because we think we're going to do it wrong or we're going to, you know, we're not holding the bow right or we are not, this is not quite perfect. Yeah. Yeah. But then you don't do the reps it's and then you don't happen. practice and then you don't get better. Yeah. So you just do it and you put it out, yeah. you know, done and that's better true. than perfect. Yeah, that's true for <laughs> things like performance anxiety. I tell a lot of my students, the reason you're feeling performance anxiety is because you don't perform enough, right? You're, you're get your, you have our two recitals each year and you, it, you feel like this is this big thing. But if you just set up like a performance for family and friends, like once a week, this would be just another performance, right? And that's definitely part of it. Obviously, like, you know, it's not quite that simple. Like even as a professional, I still get anxiety, but I'm able to like 
move through it because of all the times I performed before and it went fine, right? So, you know, ultimately just like getting, yeah, the repetition. Yeah, I think, I, I think yeah, and like just like distinguishing also, like just figuring out like what is the, like what's stopping you? What's the mental block? Yeah. Um, with yeah. performance anxiety, it's like, well, what are what is it that we're so scared of? Like, yes. what's the worst case scenario? Yes. And that works for some. Like some of it makes how, it Yeah, I know. And then I, like, how, I how know how that is. Some it. people are like, because then <laughs> other imaginations take them on this terrible journey and then they can't get out. But I think it's maybe a, like a valid <laughs> thing to go through anyways. Like, yeah. hey, let's talk about this like worst <laughs> possible thing that can happen. And yeah. I mean, I think uh, we just can't take ourselves too seriously or any of this too seriously. Yeah. Come on, what are we doing? We're wiggling fingers? <laughs> pulling some horse hair across like steel I know, right? is it what's gonna happen like, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's 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 beautiful you know i mean it's beautiful yeah. what we do i love this yeah. i love this world i love but it's this not high stakes <laughs> yeah it really isn't yeah. and it shouldn't be like and it, like yeah. do we still love what we're doing and are yeah. we is, is there still joy from playing yeah. and are is the student getting joy from playing because if yeah. you're just going to be you know a nervous wreck <laughs> Which I like. I've been there. Oh yeah. Um, and it's not to discourage. Like, <laughs> you know, it's just kind of to maybe come back to like the present moment again and just realize that of all of the things that are happening in the world right now, like messing up a shift or five shifts <laughs> or yeah. forgetting half of your piece in a concert is maybe not yeah. the end of the world. <laughs> yeah, literally, no one's going to go out of the concert thinking about that shift that you screwed up. <laughs> yeah, no one's no one's day is going to be ruined. <laughs> Because you played poorly, right. somebody might demand a refund. <laughs> that's so funny. Well, I think this is all all the questions I have for you that I can think of. Is there anything else that you would Well, I I know I still had a few more, but I also know that we've our conversation has <laughs> it's gone a while. I think it's gone maybe, a while. Maybe, so maybe that might can... be Spot, and we could maybe come back again in the future and have another one. Yeah, one I think that, that would be a lot of fun. I think this is this is going to be really nice for people to listen to. I think they'll get a lot of value out of it. Thank you so much for, for putting sure. this together. Oh yeah, and I'm going to spend enough space. Yeah. I'm really, I really like. Uh, oh, yeah. really liking what I see so far. This is my first yeah. time on the this platform. Oh, it's it's a great platform. I don't know if you want to look around briefly, like to see what's what's here. You know, like where you're, where we were, there was that reception area yeah. with all the rooms. I did so see if you, that. Yeah, if you go back there, you can see all the different types of rooms that are there for different ensembles and like there's a stage and yeah, yeah it's, it's really I, I'm great. Gonna, I'm gonna explore it actually. I'm considering yeah. maybe maybe making the shift because yes. that's what I see. Ooh, thunder. Do you just hear thunder where you yeah, are? Yeah, but on your end, no, I didn't oh, hear weird. it. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. So this was great. It was really nice to talk to you and uh, share these ideas. Yeah, it's been a lot I of fun. Hope, yeah, I hope a lot of people come to your event. <laughs> Thank you so much for letting me plug that, by the oh, way. Yeah. Oh, yeah, no <laughs> worries. And I hope to see you there. Yes, And if you for can't sure. make it, then I will, you'll have the recording to add to your pile of recordings. I have a few. <laughs> yeah.